I'm Dr. Neil Skolnick, and today we are going to talk about the American Geriatric Society's 2023 updated Bears Criteria, Guidance for Medication Use in Older Adults. These are important criteria because we know that medications in older adults are metabolized differently and have different effects than they do in a younger population. For the sake of these criteria, older adults are defined as those greater than or equal to 65 years of age. That said, we know that everyone from 65 to 100 is not in the same category. The older someone is, the more comorbidities they have, the more frail they are, the more sensitive they are to the effects of drugs and the side effects of drugs. The guidance uses the term potentially inappropriate medications for older adults, PIM. The word potentially here is important because this is guidance. We, as clinicians, make decisions around individuals. I'm going to try and cover what I think are the most important highlights of the criteria. There's a lot in here worth reading. Let's dive in. First, aspirin. Since the risk of major bleeding increases with age for primary prevention, not secondary prevention, but primary prevention of atherosclerotic disease, the harm is greater than the benefit in older adults, so aspirin should not be used for primary prevention. It should still be used for secondary prevention. Next, anticoagulation. Warfarin for treatment of AFib, DVT, or pulmonary embolus should be avoided if possible. Warfarin has a higher risk of major bleeding, particularly intracranial bleeding, than the DOAX. Therefore, DOACs are preferred. Now, among the DOACs, rivaroxaban should be avoided as it has a higher risk of bleeding in older adults than the other DOACs. And apixaban is the preferred DOAC over dibigatran. Now, if someone is well controlled on warfarin, you can consider continuing that medication. Next up, and this is a tough one, antipsychotics, and that includes both first and second generation antipsychotics, things like aripiprazole, haloperidol, quintiapin, risperidone, and others. The guidance says to avoid this except for the FDA approved indications, which include schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and adjuvant treatment of depression. The reason the guidance says to avoid this is because they lead to an increased risk of stroke, heart attack, and increased mortality. Now, this is tough because essentially what it's saying is don't use these medicines lightly for people with agitated dementia. But those of us who practice uh, with an older population know that agitated dementia is a difficult issue for which there are no great medications that work and that are safe. So the Beers criteria recognizes this in saying that the medicine should be avoided unless behavioral interventions have failed. So there are times when you need to use these medicines, but use them judiciously. For patients with dementia, anticholinergics, particularly combinations of anticholinergics, antipsychotics, and benzodiazepines should be avoided if possible which brings us to benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines should be avoided in older adults since older adults have increased sensitivity to the effects of benzos and they have decreased more metabolism, which leads to an extended half-life and higher serum levels. Given that, what happens in older adults is that benzos can increase the risk of cognitive impairment, delirium, falls, fractures, and even motor accidents. So this is a serious area. The same concerns are true of the non-benzodiazepine sleeping medicines, the so-called Z drugs. Next up, NSAIDs. Another tough one because NSAIDs have a common place in our practice. 
But we need to think carefully about the risk benefit ratio of NSAIDs in older adults because we often underappreciate those risks. Upper GI ulcers and bleeding occurs in approximately 1% of patients treated for three to six months with an NSAID and two to 4% of patients treated for a year. NSAIDs also increase the risk of renal impairment as well as cardiovascular disease. Therefore, short term, perhaps judiciously try to avoid long-term. Other medicines that are mentioned on the list include to avoid, if possible, sulfonylureas because of their relatively high risk of hypoglycemia. If they're used, then please use a short-acting sulfonylurea like glipizide rather than a long-acting sulfonylurea. PPIs should not be used long-term. Digoxin shouldn't be first-line agent for AFib or heart failure because decreased renal clearance in the elderly, which often occurs with acute illness, can lead to an increase in serum levels to toxic amounts. Particularly avoid any dosages greater than 0.125 milligrams per day in the elderly. When I see an older person with a dose of 0.25 that I might be admitting to a nursing home, I really carefully look at serum levels and usually will decrease that dose or contact the physician who started that. Nitrofurantoin should be avoided with creatinine clearances less than 30 and also should be avoided for long-term suppressive therapy. Finally, avoid medicines that have high anticholinergic side effects when used together, things like scopalamine, diphenhydramine, oxybutynine, cyclobenzaprine, and others. Try not to add one anticholinergic onto another. For everything we do, it's important to understand the benefits and the risks of the drugs we prescribe, and it's important to remember that the elderly are a particularly vulnerable population. The Beers criteria provides guidance here. We take care of individuals. We make decisions about individuals knowing the data. The Beers criteria is helpful. I'm interested in your thoughts. I'm interested in your experience. Please include in your comments below things that you find particularly either problematic in the elderly or things you might not agree with that we've talked about here. Please leave those thoughts in the comments section. I'm Dr. Neil Skolnick, and this is Medscape.